All right. <clears throat> well. We may have some signs of life here. Well, the video seems to be working. Um, it has been a little while since I've done one of these, and apparently I've forgotten completely how everything works. So um, we are way late, so I appreciate anybody who stuck around or was paying attention or who is joining us fresh because they got the notification. Hopefully, I say this pretty much every week, um, hopefully we're going to get these bugs worked out before too long. I think the tech issues are mostly gone. It's just a matter of trying to bring everything back together and um, putting it where it belongs. But fortunately, 2020 um, does look to be a little bit easier year for a lot of this stuff. So um, we'll get started here in just about 60 seconds or so. I can figure out where one last thing might come into play. that button does. Alright. So the notifications aren't working quite as they should, so it's going to be a little bit tricky to uh, get the comments and things like that, but I'm going to do the best that I can. We're going to make a little bit of, uh, hey, there we go. Uh, we got a couple of things firing up here. Uh, welcome to Char from Canada and Kay. I uh, hope you're still with us here. Uh, we'll go ahead and try to get started because we're going to fumble around for quite a bit, I think, I'm afraid. Um, my name is Mike Hess, uh, and this is Breathe TV. This is the live version of our Facebook group, COPD Navigator. Um, this is a show that we do about twice a month to bring you the latest and greatest in the world of COPD. We know that this is a disease that has a lot of confusion out there. There's a lot of misinformation, a lot of complex information that isn't always easy to kind of figure out what's going on. Um, the goal of COPD Navigator is to make sure that uh, people living with COPD, their caregivers, their loved ones, their family members, uh, the clinical community, and anybody else who has an interest in COPD um, has the ability to be partners in the care uh, and uh, in the research and the development of new therapies and eventually someday a cure. Um, what we're going to do, the way the show usually works is... Um, try and get to a spot where I can see the, uh, oop, that's a little too much volume there. Trying to get to a place where we can see some of the comments and things like that. We try to get this to as wide an audience as we can. So uh, if you're joining us on Facebook, please feel free to share with uh, uh, your Facebook groups and your Facebook walls and all that sort of thing. Uh, you can also be joining us via YouTube. I know a lot of people these days are not real high on Facebook, uh, and Facebook certainly has some issues, so YouTube provides us a, a way to uh, uh, be able to share the information without having to do logins and things like that. <clears throat> so, um, the way this usually works is, like I said, we do this about every two weeks, and if you're new to the program, and uh, um, we usually start with uh, three of the biggest news topics of the last, uh, the intervening two weeks or the last little while. Um, since this is only about two weeks into 2020 and the show is uh, basically um, a 2019 year in review, there hasn't really been a whole lot that's happened over the last two weeks. Um, and we're going to cover some of the things that happened in 2019 as we go on. So we're going to actually skip the, uh, the news break this time around. Uh, we're going to have a little bit of a talk uh, about some of the what I saw as some of the biggest uh, updates in the world of COPD in the year 2019. And then at the end, of course, uh, the biggest reason why we want to make sure we're getting those notifications and all that stuff is uh, there is time for you to ask uh, questions and answers live. Um, I am a respiratory therapist. I have been for uh, going on uh, 14 years now. 
Um, I have specialized in COPD for about the last five years. I am the administrator of COPD Navigator uh, here on Facebook or uh, uh, and also the uh, the media channel on YouTube. I uh, am fairly active, not as active as I'd like to be in the online COPD uh, community um, because I also have a day job where I do advocacy and education through primary care here in Kalamazoo, Michigan. Uh, in 2019, uh, that took up quite a bit of time. It was one of those things where the good news was uh, uh, the real world stuff was starting to take off. The bad news was uh, th this thing where I really got my start and where I really consider my, my, my heart to be at. Um, had to take a little bit of a back seat uh, for a little while, but uh, we're looking at changing that in 2020. Um, still having some trouble with some of the notifications, but we're going to do what we can, uh, and we are going to go ahead and get started. Of course, um, you may know um, the big kahuna internationally in the world of COPD is an organization called the Global Initiative for Chronic Obstructive Lung Disease, or GOLD. Um, yeah, new software is not working out quite so so good either. So this organization called Gold is the leading international organization uh, for the uh, um, advocacy and strategy recommendations for care in the world of COPD. Uh, every year they come out with a new update to their strategy guides. Um, and unfortunately I just lost a whole bunch of the stuff I had ready to go here. But what we're going to do is we are going, oh here we go. We are going to talk about what happened uh, in the 2019 um, Gold COPD our, uh, strategy recommendation updates. Um, one of the biggest things is uh, from time to time they go through and they do um, they do more of a, a, a heavy review of, of what the what the best practice recommendations are in COPD. Uh, 2019 was not one of those years. This is this was more of kind of a polish year where they take uh, whatever's happened uh, in in uh, their research. You know, they look at some of the latest peer reviewed articles. Um, there's a scientific committee that looks and sees uh, what, the, what the latest strategy is, what the highest quality evidence is for those recommendations. Uh, and they do kind of, a, our, our, our fancy word is iterative review, or they just kind of, they make some tweaks to where some of those recommendations are. That's really what happened this year. Although one of the, the more significant tweaks was the change in what the definition of COPD is. This is something that has been changing off and on uh, for the last uh, 20 odd years or so, uh, as long as gold has been around, and arguably 50 or 60 years ever since COPD was really first defined back in the mid 20th century. Um, but currently what we're looking at with COPD is, um, and I'm reading for, from the report now, uh, COPD is a heterogeneous, which means it's got variety, a disease or syndrome that is characterized by persistent respiratory symptoms on uh, airflow limitation due to airway or alveolar abnormalities. Now, that's a lot of complex medical talk basically saying that you have constant symptoms and that you have uh, difficulty exhaling the air. That's where the airflow limitation is due to something in your airways, the pipes that get down uh, into the lungs, or the alveoli, which are the air sacs within the lungs where the oxygen gets into your bloodstream and the carbon dioxide comes out. Uh, either one of those issues can cause um, problems. You know, uh, a lot of times we separate it out into uh, when there's a problem with the alveoli, that, that's what we call emphysema because you lose some of the stretchiness and the recoil of your lungs and they get kind of like, um, like a hefty bag. Um, and it's hard to get that air back out. Or with the airways, a lot of times that's going to be more of the chronic bronchitis where you have a lot of the phlegmy, mucusy cough, you're bringing stuff up a lot, and those airways get a lot smaller. Um, so you have those, air, those limitations, usually caused by significant exposure to particles or gases and uh, influenced by other factors, including abnormal lung development. So um, in the in the developed world, like here in the U.S. or you know a lot of the the more uh, affluent nations, the leading cause of COPD is uh, tobacco smoke. 
uh, in the developing world, um, the, the less, less affluent countries, it actually tends to be uh, what we call biomass fuel. These are people who use wood-burning stoves and things like that, and around the, they're around that smoke all day long. And that's where they're getting um, those same kind of particles that you get from tobacco smoke. And that, that chronic exposure to that, and that's what's causing their COPD. Um, we also know that there are certain internal factors to people that can influence the development. Uh, some of them we're aware of, um, like there's a disease called alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency that's a, uh, basically genetic emphysema that causes ongoing lung damage. And there are things that we aren't as clear on, like we know that uh, women tend to uh, get more severe um, COPD than men these days, more frequent COPD, uh, they're more frequently diagnosed with COPD. Uh, something about the female genes that tend to make, make you all um, more susceptible to this kind of damage. We don't know exactly why that is, but that does appear to be the case. So uh, people with asthma tend to develop these things uh, later in life because you have a variety of issues going on in there. Um, the last thing that is, uh, or two, two more key points here, um, significant comorbidities may have an impact on morbidity and mortality. And what that is saying, again, that's fancy medical talk for you may have other stuff going on that's related to the COPD that increases your symptoms and m gives you earlier mortality, makes you, to be blunt, makes you die faster. Um, we know that there's a variety of things that aren't even necessarily lung related. A lot of folks with COPD have um, issues with uh, other inflammatory things, uh, where they have issues with diabetes, things like that. All of those things working together can make a vicious circle. If you can't breathe, then it's easy to put on some extra pounds and you want, and if you can't breathe and things are heavy and workouts are tough, then you're less likely to work out. And then you get more out of shape and you maybe put on a little bit more extra weight and that just makes it tougher to breathe and all that kind of stuff. So that's where we talk about these comorbidities, and that's why it's interesting that gold is now, over the last couple of years, more and more added that talk about looking at comorbidities, of those extra factors, in the setting of COPD. This isn't just a disease of the lungs anymore. It's a disease of the brain, the mind, anxiety, depression, uh, confusion, all those kind of things. Um, all the organ systems are affected when you either have too much carbon dioxide or not enough oxygen, both of which can happen with COPD. Um, the last thing, and this is going to be kind of a, a thread that goes uh, uh, during this presentation, um, and then we're going to talk about it probably a couple of times throughout the course of the year, but this is a very interesting sentence that they've added um, that says, there may be significant lung pathology, like emphysema, in the absence of airflow limitation that needs further evaluation. So a couple of years back, we had a, uh, there was a conference called um, uh, COPD-10 USA, and one of the big talks there was, what do we tell people when they have, they have a history of smoking, they have these risk factors, they have um, symptoms every day, they've had, they have activity limitation, or they've got the, the smoker's cough every morning, they're bringing stuff up, um, they're short of breath, they're doing all these things. But then we go to, we take them to the doctor's office because we tell them, well, spirometry is a diagnostic standard, and then their spirometry ends up being uh, pretty normal. What do we do with those people? Do we say that you don't have COPD? Well, you've got every other component to it, um, but you don't have obstruction. So I guess you don't have COPD, but you don't have asthma, you don't have cystic fibrosis, you don't have any of these things. So again, it's interesting that gold is starting to put that into the definition because much like we're talking about, it's not just a disease of the lungs anymore. There's other stuff going on that has to be considered. There are other things at work here and that people may benefit from therapies developed for COPD, um, even if they're not in these trials or don't have the, these, um, um, these clinical markers. And, and the flip side to that is maybe we should be including some more of these people who have these risk factors, who have these symptoms, who have the, this impact in their lives, even though they don't have the, the number, even though they're, they're, not, they're not going by the number. Um, and, and it's one of those things where everything old is new again. I, I still tell people one of the very first lessons I learned in respiratory school um, was that you treat the patient and not the number. You know, no matter what it is, you see, you know, the, the computer or the machine can tell you everything is fine, but you're looking at somebody who's struggling. You've got to treat that person. You can't just go by the numbers. So, again, as things develop here in the world of COPD, it's going to be interesting to see how that 
definition evolves. So now we're going to try and hit the right button here. For some reason my trackpad is not working very well today. Uh, I guess I, the good news is I washed my hands, but maybe the bad news is I washed them too much and it's just not sticking. Uh, but at any rate, so we talked about the new definition. Now another big controversy in the world of COPD and asthma is how do we define this idea of asthma COPD overlap syndrome? A few years back, Gold and its asthma equivalent called GINA uh, worked together to say, well, we've got these people that have uh, these symptoms all the time. And we've got these people who, are, who, are, who have asthma. You know, they have these uh, asthma attacks and wheezing and all that stuff. And then we've got people who have both. Where is that overlap? How do we define those people that have aspects of both these diseases? And what do we do to treat them? And what was really interesting about this is this kind of flew under the radar, including to myself. I was actually at a conference with uh, Dr. Anzueto, uh, who is on the, the Gold uh, Scientific Committee, um, and we we're having an, an aside conversation, uh, him and, and myself and a handful of other people, and he said, you know, it's really surprising to me that absolutely nobody has noticed that Gold completely took out any mention of um, ACOS. There's no more, there, there's been debate for the last couple of years. It's been kind of back and forth a little bit. Is it a separate entity? Is it COPD with asthma? Is it asthma with chronic obstruction? Now it's completely separate and the, the current in vogue style is if you have these symptoms of asthma, like you've got the inflammation and you've got the reactive airways and you've got that, those issues, then you have asthma and you're going to be treated like you have asthma according to asthma recommendations. If you don't, then you have COPD and you're going to be treated uh, on those recommendations. And it's something I struggle with myself a little bit. I'm not sure that I entirely agree with that. Um, I tend to be kind of a practical guy at heart. And no matter what label we put on stuff, we're going to be treating people, uh, again, treating the patient, not the number. And so a lot of times what I, what I tell people uh, in, my, in my clinical life is that you have chronic obstruction uh, with reactive airways. You know, you have this ongoing symptoms of COPD, but you also have the hallmarks of asthma. And so sometimes you get relief from those uh, uh, short-acting reliever inhalers like albuterol. Um, and maybe those are the people who you need to use the, the um, um, inhaled corticosteroids a little bit more with. It's a really, it's tightrope, honestly. And as we continue to change the, the definition of COPD and as we continue to isolate what these different groups are that benefit the most from a lot of these therapies, that's um, probably going to continue to change uh, throughout. So getting a couple of questions here. Um, we've got uh, Char, FEV1 is excellent now, but with spirometry showing a jagged line showing damage that cannot expel air well. Um, and, you know, again, that, that kind of comes down to a lot of that stuff is if you, especially uh, with, it's hard to recover a lot of FEV1, that sort of thing. But um, depending on whether you're having a good day for one test and a bad day for another test, you can get improvement. Uh, and a lot of times we look at the shape of that curve there. Uh, another question about keto, which uh, um, Roger, what we will touch on that in a little bit here. I want to try to get through some of this other stuff here. We did start a bit late and I want to um, try not to mess up people's schedules too much. Um, so we've got this idea of no more uh, asthma COPD overlap. Uh, one thing that they did add is we've talked a little bit about vitamin D. Uh, speaking of nutrition, uh, and I'll give you, Roger, I'll give you a quick answer. Uh, keto, um, in theory, is a very good diet. I know one person in particular in the group, uh, and uh, he's never been shy about it, a gentleman by the name of Russell Winwood has had fantastic results with it. Um, I would say that it's probably not for everyone because it is difficult to do well. Um, it is. It requires a lot of commitment, um, but we know that um, as general rules, protein is great. Fats, healthy fats are okay. Carbs are not so great. Um, so the, the keto diet could be a good thing. Um, but again, it's really going to come down to some of those other, um, those comorbid conditions, what, other, what the other dietary requirements are. And if somebody is willing and able, because keto can also be kind of expensive, um, if somebody is willing and able to do it properly, like an actual full-on keto. 
Um, but we will be having some nutrition talks through the year, so I encourage you to uh, um, take a peek in uh, here and there uh, as we get into that. Or, again, this is a great opportunity to let you know that uh, in our Facebook group, COPD Navigator, we do cover a lot of these things, um, nutrition, exercise, uh, rehabilitation programs. Um, I've seen some discussions about uh, intimacy. We want to talk about anxiety, depression, making sure you're not isolated. So come on down and join us. Uh, COPD Navigator on Facebook. Easy to find if you search it out. Uh, done wonders with Roger. That's fantastic. You know, again, and Russell, he'll, he'll tell you the same thing. That uh, works great for him. Uh, for those of you who don't know, Russell also goes by COPD Athlete and uh, has done literally done marathons and Ironman events and, and uh, bicycle races. And, and he's, a fan, he's do, currently doing long-term research into using keto for this. So can be a great opportunity. Um, I just caution that there, there's never a one-size-fits-all solution, whether it's medications, whether it's exercises, whether it's diet. Um, it's one of those things that does have to be tailored to the individual, which is why uh, we want to make sure everybody has the tools to ask your clinical team, you know, knowing the details of your case, um, what is a good diet for me. So, And again, that takes us back to vitamin D. Um, it's not so much that you should get extra vitamin D. I mean, you, you shouldn't run out to your, your local um, vitamin retailer and buy a big jar of, of vitamin D supplements because it's not necessarily a hyper level of vitamin D. What we want to see is that you have a normal level of vitamin D. And um, here, in Mich like I said before, I'm in Michigan, and in these northern latitudes, um, it's difficult to get enough vitamin D in the wintertime, certainly. And then as, um, for better or for worse, as, as many of us spend more and more of our time indoors, uh, not exposed to sunlight, which is our primary source of vitamin D, uh, it is really easy to get low levels of vitamin D. And we have seen that uh, those low, those subnormal levels of vitamin D are associated with more frequent COPD exacerbation. So now making sure that you have get vitamin D testing done um, and making sure that you um, are at those good levels and if not, then doing supplementation, that is now um, a, good, um, a good recommendation from, from gold. Um, next thing, and uh, one of the, the biggest, uh, the, the, well, I've been saying that a lot, but and a very interesting thing from, oh, come on, where's my, there we go. No, oh, everything just went out of order. Come on. Hey, there we go. Um, we, and this may sound a little bit soapboxy, and, and honestly it probably is, uh, we are, are, are Western, especially in the U.S. medical uh, system, is very heavily reliant on medications for pretty much anything. And COPD is no exception. And uh, truly, you know, even the, the international recommendations uh, say that medications are the front line of, of therapy because it's the easiest thing to do, um, relatively speaking, to procedures and things like that. It's somewhat less expensive. Uh, drug costs are a whole other talk we can get into, but um, this is kind of the frontline therapy. But over the last couple of years, uh, we've had a couple of things that um, are less expensive than surgical procedures. Like your lung transplants, your or, or, or the actual what we call lung volume reduction surgery. That's the LVRS in the uh, uh, in the uh, description here where they actually take out some of the damaged part of your lung and put, or they don't put anything in, they just take it out and allow the healthier parts to expand and work a little bit more normally. Those are, you know, of course, huge, huge surgical procedures with the risks involved with pretty much every surgical procedure. So now we're starting to see more of these, uh, what we call bronchoscopic uh, lung volume reduction processes um, that are working similarly well to some of these other ones. And I believe for the first time this year, I think this was the big part of the update, um, the endobronchial valves uh, received what, the, the grade A evidence recommendations, which means they've done random, you know, the, the highest level research, the, uh, the randomized controlled trials, and they've seen uh, definite um, improvements, quality of life. Um, I 
can't remember if they had longevity increases or not. I want to say no still, but significant quality of life improvements uh, with some of these valves. And then with a couple of the other um, the a couple of the other processes, the coils that actually help squeeze down some of the uh, the damaged tissue, uh, and then then what we call this vapor ablation, where they actually seal some of it shut so that it, the the gas, the trapped gas, ends up coming out and can't reinflate. Um, all of those those two things got the grade B. The valves got the grade A. So we're seeing some of these non-pharmacological, non-medication uh, interventions that are having really positive results for a lot of people and are potentially a good option. Again, never a one size fits all solution, but these things can work very well for people uh, in the right cases. So uh, that was the big news out of gold this year. And then the COPD Foundation, if I can, the clickies just aren't working well today come on is let's see hopefully this doesn't mess up a whole bunch of stuff i'm going to try and wipe off the trackpad just a touch and see if i can nope that didn't work the real bummer is my mouse is not working either so oh all right so Gold, of course, is the biggest international uh, group, but we also in the U.S. here and uh, trying to go international is the COPD Foundation. And uh, I have worked with the COPD Foundation quite a bit as a volunteer and uh, one of the state advocacy captains uh, for Michigan. Uh, the foundation does some fantastic work um, in advocacy and promoting research and all that stuff. They had a pretty good year this uh, in 2019 also. Uh, one of the biggest things that they had uh, that they released was um, there we go okay so we went a little bit out of order here but uh, because of some of these glitches in the uh, um, the uh, um, tappy taps we're going to move ahead and just, uh, I guess we're going to, spoiler alert, we're going to see them all at once. So first and foremost, uh, I want to highlight the uh, um, a Pocket Consultant app that they released a new version of this year. I'm going to bring it up on my phone real quick here as soon as I remember how to spell. Um, but the, the Pocket Consultant app has been fantastic for quite a while. It's a great resource that has a lot of the... Um, uh, information that you're going to want to look at uh, from a from a clinician standpoint and did I take it off my phone well that's weird it was on my phone oh there it is it's just under the a little bit hard to find I guess so this is um a little bit hard to see because of the glare but this is the COPD pocket consulting guide the really nice thing about this is um, you'll notice that if you can see it, I'm going, to try, oops, I'm going to try and get it there. You can see there it says provider view. The really cool thing is you can also change this to patient view. And what this is, this gives you some activity tracking. Um, this lets you know so that you can kind of see whether things are getting uh, good, better, good, good, better, or better, I guess. Um, with things like cleaning or making your bed, brushing your teeth. Are you having trouble um, uh, running out of breath doing things like that? Um, you can look at your own COPD National Action Plan. You know, what does a normal day look like for you? It's a little bit different for depending on who you are. What does a bad day look at? Uh, it's got one of the really nice features. Uh, one of the things that kind of uh, uh, stopped one of my projects because I didn't have to uh, reinvent the wheel here you can get inhaler technique videos. Inhalers, you know, as important as they are, they are some of the most misunderstood and misused um, parts of a COPD management plan because much like we like to put people on meds, we're really good at, at telling people to take these meds, but we're not very good at telling people how to take the meds or making sure they're on the right device for them. So these videos can be fantastic. Um, with a lot of these, uh, if you ever have any questions or if you're having some trouble remembering exactly how to use it, uh, the Pocket Consulting Guide is a fantastic tool um, to help you find that. 
Uh, the next thing here you can see uh, on the list is uh, COPD gene continues to deliver. COPD gene has been a long time research study that has looked at lots and lots and lots of people in the COPD community uh, to again try to figure out where 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 are the common ground? You know, how do we figure out how bad COPD is? How severe it is? You know, how do we look at a lot of these statistical things? And another huge uh, publication came out toward the end of 2019, right around COPD Awareness Month, which is in November, which takes us to part three, um, a potential new diagnostic model for COPD. You know, we, we talked a little bit before about how Gold is looking at um, redefining what COPD is. COPD Foundation is now looking at um, do we need to come up with a new model for how we say somebody has COPD. Uh, historically, we've looked at that spirometry value where you look at what comes out in the first second, your FEV1, compared to what comes out in the entire breath or your forced uh, vital capacity, your FEC. Uh, and if that wasn't at least 70%, then we said, well, you've got COPD, and depending on exactly how low your FEV1 was, that kind of gave us an idea about severity. Now, the COPD Foundation, and I'm going to see if this will, oh, shoot, it is not working well at all. Um, the COPD Foundation is Hey, there we go. Okay, so the COPD Foundation is now looking at whether we should be looking again at some of the more practical things. And they, they did this study of these people who were in COPD gene, and they found they could kind of put the kind of put them in the in these four categories here. Ooh, that's a good maneuver. These four categories, where if you've had exposure, um, that's your tobacco smoke, that's your biomass smoke, you know, those kind of things. That was one checkbox. If you have symptoms, if you have um, a relatively high COPD assessment test score, or you have a pretty high symptom burden, or the uh, the modified modified medical research council uh, breathlessness score, if you're having these ongoing symptoms, that's another checkbox. Uh, if you have emphysema or damage like that on a CT scan, that's a checkbox. If you and then if you have spirometry, that's another checkbox. So they found these four big categories, and they found. Uh, and I'm gonna, they, they published these uh, uh, in this, this uh, um, let's see, when did this come out? This came out, uh, it was published October, it was accepted October 11th, 2019, um, and then published not terribly long after that, like I said, just about in time for COPD Awareness Month. And you can find this on the, uh, the COPD Foundation's uh, uh, fa uh, website. It's called uh, Redefining the Diagnosis of Chronic Obstructive Pulmonary Disease. So they came up with these uh, these four diamonds, these four parts of the diamond here, and then they saw, uh, they put them into the, these different uh, potential categories here. And they saw that if you only had, um, if it was only exposure and you didn't have any symptoms, your spirometry was fine, you didn't have any problems on CT scan, then you don't have COPD. Which makes sense. I mean, yeah, you've had exposure, but I mean, you can be exposed to a lot of stuff. Um, you can be exposed to the sun and not get a sunburn or, or, or things like that. You know, you may have the exposure and you may be at risk for that stuff, but you don't have it. Um, but then if you start having two of these things, if you have exposure with any of the other three, with one of the, uh, the other three, that's what we call what, what they consider to be possible COPD. Because you've got the exposure and you've got a problem, and it's probably related to the exposure. So it's not something that we can necessarily say for sure, but it is possible. So maybe we should start be, start treating that as it's COPD. If you have three of them, if you have the exposures and you have two of the other things, so maybe you have an exposure um, and you have symptoms and your spirometry is terrible then you probably have COPD. And, you know, again, this is according to the, tra the traditional model, you do have COPD. This new model says you probably have COPD. Um, even if you have, and, and this is where we've talked a couple of times now, those people who have the symptoms, they have the exposure, they have the CT imaging, their spirometry is okay. 
now we can still say, yeah, you have probable COPD because you still have all of these things going on, even though your spirometry is okay for now. Uh, now we're starting to categorize those folks and say, maybe these treatments are going to be available to you. Maybe these things can help you. Maybe these clinical trials can be available to you. And then, uh, as logic might dictate, if you have all four, you got COPD for sure. Definite COPD, as they call it. Um, so this is really interesting. This could, this is a potential game changer in a couple of different ways. A few years back, um, when gold moved away from looking at strictly the airflow limitation, the, the, the airflow problems, and looking at more of the, the symptom-based things um, to figure out how severe, how bad your COPD was, that was really a game changer in the COPD community. And this, I think, has the potential to be very similar to that um, because it's not something that we often talk about. Um, and again, we haven't really looked at how to include a lot of these folks in the clinical trials. So um, it could be very interesting, uh, could be a very interesting way to look at things uh, and it could be a, a potential, like I said, a potential game changer. Um, I don't, I try not to say that lightly because uh, um, you know, we have a lot of game changers and we have a lot of things here, but I do think it could be a really big deal. I'm just trying to take a look at, we are also live on um, Oops, we're also live on YouTube, and I'm supposed to be getting notifications from that, and I'm not, so I just wanted to take a peek real quick to see if anybody was chatting on there. Um, if uh, you happen to, to catch only some of this and you want to make sure that you're catching up later on, uh, you will be able to get this uh, available on YouTube, uh, so don't fret about that. All right, so... Big news from the foundation, big news from gold. Um, our next big thing was the ever popular topic of talking about electronic cigarettes. And we're going to skip ahead just a touch here. Also, um, these ideas of, uh, we call them vapes, we call them e-cigs, we call them all these different things, call them by their brand names, all that. Um, you will see the term electronic nicotine delivery system um, in a lot of the clinical stuff because that kind of brings everything uh, under one roof. Uh, they look like all these different things. You see pipes, you see uh, the ones with the big tanks, you see ones that look like just like uh, traditional cigarettes, you see the uh, Doctor Who sonic screwdriver looking ones. You see all these things out there, they're all doing the same thing. And they had a pretty rough year, especially toward the end of the year where uh, here in Michigan we were very excited to be the first state to ban uh, flavored e-liquid uh, and which was uh, swiftly um, attacked in court by some of the providers of these e-liquids even though these flavors and again I'll soapbox a little bit but I'm pretty passionate about this these flavors serve no purpose but to, uh, to uh, hook teens and, and kids on, on e-cigs that's the bottom line um, there's no other reason for them um, but there was this whole idea of what uh, CDC eventually came, be, you know, called e-valley or uh, e-cigarette slash vape associated acute lung injury um, where these otherwise healthy, often young folks were ending up in the ICU on ventilators. We've had some deaths uh, and their only common ground was um, electronic cigarette use. Now, as time has gone on, most of these folks have been, uh, it has come out where they've been, they were using um, THC or you know uh, cannabis related cannabis extract related vapes uh, that had vitamin E acetate as a preservative and so then there was this whole discussion about uh, well okay so it, it's not tobacco it's just it's big tobacco trying to fight back and you know or, or the government trying to, to um, 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 overstep again um, but the fact of the matter is there are nicotine you know straight up nicotine or, or um, I don't want to call them tobacco but these these electronic nicotine systems some of them also have the vitamin E acetate in them uh, especially if you're getting them from and this is not any kind of anti small business thing or anything like that but if you go to your hometown shop that maybe isn't quite as regulated or um, even inadvertently you're getting all this stuff into into the mix sometimes you're still at risk you know these things are still unproven for tobacco cessation um, 
they really have a whole boatload of problems associated with them, including these, uh, these, uh, um, uh, these ICU cases. And I did have one or two people um, who said uh, that that was finally enough to scare them off of it. And they were actually, I've got um, two people in particular I can think of. One's been completely nicotine-free for three months, and I think one is pushing six months now. Um, maybe not quite that maybe it's a, a four months because it hasn't been that long since the e-valley stuff but um, we've gotten some some scares going and uh, these these things are just not good which takes us to the next point here yeah it actually worked this time a study came out um, in December um, where that was that started to that gave us our first association between uh, vapes and COPD or chronic lung disease. Now this was this was a pretty well written um, study. They were very careful to say well there are some confounding factors here. There are folks who uh, if you use vapes uh, in, in their group at least the, the, the people who used vapes were the most likely to use both uh, and had the most extreme lung damage because they were getting kind of a double whammy. Um, the group that had the, the dual users, they called them, had worse lung damage than either of the individual ones. Um, but they did see an association, even with the, uh, uh, if I recall correctly, the, the just the um, uh, electronic users um, still were at higher risk for um, a lung disease than uh, healthy controls. So, again, it comes down to there's not really anything other than um, um, oxygen maybe a little water vapor here and there. Um, anything else that's going into your lungs has the potential to cause some damage or some ill effect uh, somehow. So best suggestion, stay away from a lot of this stuff. The more data that comes out about these e-cigs, um, the less good it is. On wrapping up, kind of the biggest uh, new things of the year, we've got, uh, of course, as I mentioned, medications. Um, at the beginning of the year, we had, uh, actually, I think it was approved at the end of 2018, but really we first started to see it in 2019, um, this medication called Upelry, and I will, um, I will disclaim that uh, I am on the speaker bureau for Upelry. I do go around to some doctor's offices telling them about this medication, um, but it is unique. Um, and this is all stuff that you can, uh, uh, verify online if you think I'm not being, uh, or if you think I'm being biased in any way. The biggest thing about this particular medication is that it is a long-acting um, anticholinergic or muscarinic antagonist uh, medication, which is the class of bronchodilator that tends to uh, work a little bit better in folks with COPD as compared to those with asthma. Um, that comes from gold. That comes from some other researches that, that uh, the, for a long-acting medication, the anticholinergics do tend to be a little bit more preferred. Um, this is, uh, this was the second nebulized one to come on the market. So you didn't have to worry about uh, the coordination with the puff or being able to generate enough inspiratory flow to get the powder out. Uh, and even though it was the second to the market, it was the first that could be used with a regular nebulizer. The first one that came to market, a uh, medication called Lonhala. You had to get a, a specialized nebulizer called a, a Magnair. Um, in order to use that and that kind of altered some of the pricing a little bit because that put it onto uh, what's called Medicare Part D whereas this can be used under Medicare Part B with some uh, general supplementation and stuff like that on there. So um, the nice thing about that, um, you know, this is a once daily med, um, works pretty well. You know, again, I'm not going to get too far into it um, just because it's, uh, um, you know, what else can you say? It's a, it's a, good med for the right in the right case uh, we also had uh, come on trackpad you're failing me this was a pretty good year for generics um, one of our longtime um, combination medications that has an inhaled steroid and a uh, the other kind of bronchodilator, the beta agonist bronchodilator. Many of you may know the brand name Advair. Um, that was a medication that had fluticasone as the uh, uh, steroid and um, um, salmeterol as the bronchodilator. Um, has now uh, 
couple years ago it had a, a, a one kind of generic where fluticasone and salmeterol were together in a different kind of inhaler. That had boatloads of issues with supply. Uh, it was, it's been off and on back order pretty much all of 2019. And the dosing was a little bit different. The device was a little bit different. Um, there were just a couple of different quirks with it. Uh, this medication that's on the screen right now called Wixella is what's called a branded generic. Basically a straight up replacement for, <coughs> excuse me, for um, Advair. Tends to be a little bit less expensive. De again, depending on formularies and all that stuff. Um, Another alternative to have uh, for folks with um, who, who need these, uh, these two particular medications. Uh, a good year for generics in general. We finally started to see... Finally started to see some uh, generic albuterol come back on the market. Uh, about 10 years ago, I believe it was, maybe even a touch longer, a lot of our um, generic meter dose inhalers had to come off the market uh, because they no longer had an exception um, because they had uh, they were propelled by chlorofluorocarbons CFCs for uh, many years um, they had an exception a therapeutic exemption that uh, allowed them to continue to have that even though um, they were supposedly contributing to the ozone layer problems and so on and so forth and were taken off the market. Uh, eventually they lost that and the, the long story short, the biggest uh, 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 fallout from that was everybody got to reformulate their medication delivery and everybody got new patents. And now we're starting to see some of those patents expire again finally. Uh, first and foremost we have albuterol. We had two generics come out. We had a generic competitor to uh, uh, the Venlin brand of albuterol and a generic competitor to the Pro Air brand of albuterol. Generally speaking, uh, they've got the same medication, same active ingredient. They do have slightly different propellants, slightly different, uh, uh, when that propellants, but preservative mixes and that sort of thing. Um, the spray is a little bit different. Um, some people like Pro Air better, some people like Ventolin better. Now there's an alternative, um, there's a generic alternative for both of them. But again, kind of a, a weird follow in effect from that we're seeing, uh, um, I'm seeing, is that again, the, the companies have not updated their formularies and they're, they haven't changed a lot of the rebates they get for some of the name brand drugs. And so we're seeing actually pharmacies uh, get rejections for and the uh, insurance companies requiring prior authorization for a generic drug, which is really confusing for a lot of folks because when you go to the pharmacy, most plans uh, call want, want the generic. And so most pharmacies kind of automatically substitute the generic and so that's been wreaking havoc with paperwork for a lot of places so if you happen to uh, go get an albuterol refill and you get a message from the pharmacist or from your provider that says um, you need a prior authorization it's going to take some time don't be terribly surprised because it's still working through the process last but not least we actually did have a new name brand drug come out another new name brand drug come out um, called dual clear uh, this is a combination of the two different kinds of bronchodilators out there. No inhaled steroid, which is nice for those people who, um, uh, with the uh, less reactive airways type of disease and the more straight COPD kind of stuff, uh, they do tend to have a little bit higher risk of pneumonia with uh, corticosteroid exposure. This has no corticosteroids in it at all. It's strictly bronchodilators, um, which is nice. Uh, one of them has been around for a while. It's called Formoterol. Um, Potentially interesting too because Formoterol has a fairly rapid onset. It kicks in pretty quickly, uh, similar to Albuterol. And in a lot of parts of the world, medications containing Formoterol are actually used as rescue um, medications or, or, or reliever medications. And with some of those asthma recommendations, they're actually saying these Formoterol containing medications can be used um, both as controller and as reliever. So. Uh, the the long-acting beta agonist in here, uh, I don't know if we're going to be seeing that uh, kick in as a reliever or anything like that uh, anytime soon. That is relatively new to the market. Still been around for six, seven, eight years. Uh, but we uh, need to see a little bit more study for that before we can start saying um, that can be a reliever also. So, uh, wrapping things up here, we're going to um, hopefully, if I can again, Clicky click on the, the right spot, which I cannot. 
Come on. Uh, we're going to find it somewhere. It's so close. There we go. Clicky click on the plain screen here. So 2019 was um, maybe not, well, it has the potential to be a groundbreaking year. We had the changes in the definition of COPD uh, from gold. We had the chain, potential uh, suggested changes in diagnostic standards uh, of COPD from the COPD Foundation. Um, we had the launch of the new um, uh, patient-oriented, caregiver-oriented uh, pocket uh, consultant guide from the COPD Foundation. It could be... Um, strange audio. Well, that wouldn't surprise me too much. It just depends on how strange the audio is, I suppose. Um, I have not been able to do an audio test. This is the first I'm hearing of, of a complaint, but uh, it could very well be. Uh, might be too close or too far away from the microphone. But anyway, in any event, um, if you can hear me, the um, 2019 could be a big year. To, uh, it's really setting the stage for 2020, which could be uh, uh, also a very big year, depending on how some of these things pan out and uh, the results of some of these other um, uh, research studies. So. Um, those of you who may be new to the COPD community or new to COPD Navigator, I hope you will continue to join us throughout 2020 uh, as we continue to keep track of a lot of these updates, a lot of these changes, and uh, um, see what's new in the world of COPD. Uh, so now, uh, this is, uh, as I mentioned earlier, this uh, that was kind of the lesson plan for the day. Now it is time for questions and answers. We uh, uh, traditionally have done this more in the noon Eastern hour, um, but uh, looks like based on just the, the quick uh, stats from Facebook here, it looks like this is a little bit better, uh, more of a prime time uh, for people to, uh, to take a peek in here. So I haven't gotten a lot of questions yet, so we'll start with, uh, with Roger. While a lot of you are hopefully, if you have some questions, about something we covered today or something you'd like to uh, discuss a little bit um, about COPD, about uh, respiratory care in general, uh, that sort of thing. Get, make sure those are getting typed in now and uh, we'll get to them before we, uh, we wrap up here in a little bit. So Roger says, Roger asks, uh, what is your view on using low dose erythromycin three days a week? Um, again, this is a, a, that, that is a potentially good um, thing. We usually use azithromycin. Uh, they, they, uh, erythromycin and uh, azithromycin are both part of an antibiotic class called macrolides. And there's pretty solid evidence that tells us that uh, relatively low-dose macrolide therapy um, with azithromycin, it's 500 milligrams three times a week, Monday, Wednesday, Friday. I can't uh, remember the precise dose of erythromycin. So like I said, we don't use that one nearly as much. Um, works great for a lot of people in um, reducing exacerbations and increasing some quality of life, especially those people who have, uh, who tend more toward the chronic bronchitis end of things. Uh, when you start having a lot of that, uh, what, we, what we clinically call a mucus hypersecretion, or when you're generating a lot of that phlegm, that gunk, that junk, all that stuff, it provides a really nice environment for bacteria to grow. And as the bacteria grows, um, you start producing more junk and more uh, habitat and all that stuff, and it's this, this vicious cycle. So if you're able to eliminate some of this ongoing colonization from the bacteria through the use of an antibiotic, that can kind of break the cycle. Um, erythromycin, or excuse me, azithromycin is uh, one of the most well-studied uh, um, tools for this particular application, um, and they found... Um, Generally, it's the three times a week. There's there's a couple of different, they've played around a couple of different dosing with it, uh, but it does tend to work really well for that, uh, for those people who have those kind of symptoms. A couple of things to, to be mildly concerned about. Um, there is a potential for some hearing loss. Um, I don't remember the exact mechanism of action, but that is one of the things that was reported. There's uh, There can be some, some damage to the hearing. And these macrolides do tend to, uh, or they have the potential for some cardiac things, uh, particularly the, uh, the QT interval can change. So that can change your heart rhythm a little bit. Uh, so um, 
before you start on a macrolide, you know, of course, talk it over with your provider because you're going to have to anyway because they're going to be at it's still a prescription drug. Um, but make sure that you are aware of those risks, and it's probably a good idea to get a baseline EKG just to see if there are any changes down the road. But uh, potentially very good, uh, very good uh, um, therapy. Uh, Brian, hey, welcome in, Brian. I'm um, using Upelry for almost a year now. I've been very happy with it. Glad to hear that. Uh, again, um, you know, again with the, the disclaimer of being on the uh, the speaker bureau, as I mentioned before, um, I, I think it's it's a good drug. I wouldn't speak for it if I didn't think it, w it was a potentially good medication. Um, it, it's got a lot of upside to it. Um, similar um, risk profile, as they say, as, as the other um, 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 anticholinergics, which is to say, not very much. Um, so it, it's a good option for a lot of people. Uh, when it's on formula. It's once a day, easy to use, you don't have to worry about technique. The only downside is um, it's nebulized, so you have to do it at home, basically. Most people don't have a portable or a travel nebulizer, but most people are doing their therapy first thing in the morning at a static location anyway, so usually not too big an issue. Uh, much easier than Lon Halle, Brian says, so there you go. I uh, want to send a shout out also to uh, Jan. Uh, Janice is a fantastic COPD advocate in the uh, um, in the in the community. Uh, welcome into Carmen and Paige. Uh, welcome into some of the the viewers out there. Darcy is watching. It says uh, a couple other people out there. Appreciate everybody taking the time on this Wednesday afternoon. I don't know what the weather's like by you, but here in Michigan, it is gray and damp and cloudy. Um, weird weather right now but i have been seeing a lot of people even though we haven't had real severe cold or anything like that it is a good idea to uh, make sure that you're protecting your mouth um, when you're going outside cold air uh, despite uh, our current damp conditions uh, cold air does tend to be very dry air um, so make sure you're using your uh, humidifier when you're inside if you have one uh, if you're not and you're experiencing extra coughing or anything like that uh, that could be why. I've been seeing a lot of that lately. Uh, humidifiers, uh, saline nasal spray can help. And when you go outside, having a little scarf or something over your face to trap some of that exhaled moist air uh, as you're re-inhaling it, um, that can be helpful too if you're, if you're having those symptoms. I mean, it's not a 100% a rule or anything like that. But Super cold in Edmonton. That's the part of Canada, Charzen. Edmonton, Alberta, Canada. I always liked that, that name. When I was in high school, um, we had uh, um, season tickets to our, our local uh, hockey, college hockey team. And uh, the guys, a couple of the guys were from Edmonton, Alberta, Canada. And the announcer would always say it real enthusiastically. And so that's uh, good memories of that. So uh, we'll have one last call for, uh, for questions out there. Again, we'll touch a little bit more on that. That keto stuff can be very good. Um, if you weren't here before, Roger was asking about what thoughts were on the keto diet. Can be very good in the right person. No hard and fast, 100% uh, one-size-fits-all solution. Can be tough, can be expensive to do properly. Uh, but in general, um, if you're having a relatively high-protein diet uh, with healthy fats um, and... Um, the nice thing about those is they also tend to be kind of calorically dense and a lot of times people with COPD, because you're using so much more energy just to breathe um, or to cook and prepare and all that stuff, by the time it actually gets down to eating, you're too tired to eat. And a lot of times people are losing way too much weight and losing uh, muscle mass, which makes things even worse. Um, so it can, uh, um, can really cause a lot of issues. Uh, if you're not getting enough protein and again having those healthy fats uh, keep those carbs low um, both from a nutrition standpoint and also when carbs digest they do tend to produce a lot of gas not just in the passing gas sense but they can create a lot of gas in your belly and make it hard for your diaphragm to expand properly which you're, many of you are probably already having issues with your diaphragm uh, and when you're adding issues to that then um, it's just making it harder. So it uh, can be uh, a real problem. So uh, not seeing any more questions pop on through, and we actually have made it to the end of about an hour. So um, we were able to hopefully get a lot of the gremlins out this time around, um, and we will be back in about two weeks with the next uh, episode 
of uh, Breathe TV, uh, formerly known as COPD Navigator Live, where our topic will be. What will our topic be? Um, oh, we did have one person uh, mention sitting at uh, Triadlon Hala. Uh, a box sitting on the floor caused them to go short of breath. So um, it is certainly a possibility with, uh, with any inhaled medication. It is a little bit strange, but there is this idea of paradoxical bronchospasm um, where you can get more short of breath. It's possible with any, with any substance. We just call it an adverse effect. Um, and that's when you try something different. You can try something different in the same therapeutic class, like a, a, another beta agonist bronchodilator, another anticholinergic bronchodilator. If that happens again, then you know you can't take that class of medications. If it doesn't happen, then you were sensitive to something about that particular molecule or that particular delivery. And, you know, again, that just kind of happens sometimes. Um... Uh, so, uh, as I was saying, we're going to be back in about two weeks where we are going to be talking about um, bronchiectasis. This is an interesting one. Um, actually, just saw an article posted, because uh, I wrote it, on the COPD Foundation website talking about bronchiectasis and calling it the phantom menace because um, there are studies out there that tell us that up to half of everyone with COPD can have some degree of this bronchiectasis, which is kind of a turbocharged um, permanent colonization of that bacteria that actually causes damage to some of those airway walls um, and makes them even floppier rather than uh, inflamed or anything like that. So we're going to talk a little bit more about how the therapy differs for that, why it's important to recognize that, how you recognize it, um, and some other therapies about that. Uh, we'll get back to our usual routine of hitting up the uh, um, latest news and events uh, over the course of the next two weeks between now and then uh, we will talk about um, what's new in the world of COPD and then we will actually we will definitely um, get um, your questions and stuff answered live so uh, Jill asks can we be notified when you'll be on again absolutely if you come to our Facebook page uh, which uh, may, some of you may be there, you may have gotten there through the group, or you may have gotten there through my homepage, or uh, somebody else shared a video. Uh, go to Facebook and search for COPD Navigator, uh, and you'll find a, uh, um, it'll have the little lighthouse like you see in the corner down here. Uh, I'll figure out how to point sooner or later. Look for that logo, um, and um, follow that page. Uh, and that should give you notifications um, as to when I'm on, um, when I'm on. If you want to, if you prefer to go through YouTube, you can go to uh, youtube.com slash c slash COPD Navigator, which is uh, down here at the bottom of the screen. Um, and if you, uh, you can subscribe there and you hit the little bell icon, um, that will also give you notifications. Uh, a lot of these are going to, we're going to, I'm trying to vamp up our website here at copdnavigator.net. And we'll also be doing uh, notifications on Twitter. We now have a Twitter feed, profile, a Twitter thingy um, for COPD Navigator. We'll have updates there. Do try to post uh, fairly regularly. Uh, again, news updates. Uh, um, and you're always welcome to ask questions there as well. If you have ideas for um, later event uh, episodes of Breathe TV, uh, use any of these uh, to submit those. Um, we have uh, info... Uh, uh, Actually, I think I forgot to set up the email address on the website. But uh, So hit us up on YouTube, hit us up on Facebook, hit us up on Twitter. If you have questions, if you have comments, if you have suggestions for future episodes, or if you just want to get those notifications, or if you just want to say hello. Um, we're always, welcome, uh, always welcoming new followers and, and trying to get the word out in uh, the community and in the general public to uh, uh, raise awareness for COPD and uh, COPD-related activities. So... Uh, again, appreciate everybody stopping by today. Um, I think this is going to be a good time. Join us again uh, in two weeks. That will be January 29th uh, at 4 o'clock Eastern Time uh, here on your, wherever you're watching us now, uh, for bronchiectasis. Um, hope everybody has a great two weeks. In the meantime, uh, take care of yourselves, take care of each other as we're starting to get into the grip of winter. Uh, be careful out there. Uh, make sure you're protecting your airways. Make sure you're protecting everything else. 
and uh, we'll see you in two weeks. Take care, everybody.